a new topic, new theme, which I'm sure all of us are very interested in. We all want to follow Jesus and he changes us to become more and more like him. And the key to this transformation is our total surrender to him. So today, Thursday, and on Sunday, I'm going to speak on this topic. I do hope, and of course, this topic will be uploaded immediately on Peak Cloud as well as YouTube. It won't be like the other, other theme. So if you miss it out, you can watch on YouTube or Peak Cloud. But we're going to talk about how, even as the Apostle Paul was transformed, we can be transformed. We're going to take the example of the Apostle Paul in this context. Because for me, I'm sure for many of us, he's the very good example of transformation. The Lord Jesus Christ is not an example for transformation because he's always perfect. In him, there was no sin. He never had to change because he's always perfect. In him, there was no sin. Whereas the Apostle Paul was a terrible sinner, he, as Hebrew says, worst of sinners. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he writes, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to their tongues. So he was completely changed entirely by the grace of God. He knew that fully well. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. The grace view is not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. And grace is something God gives to all who are willing to receive. And God shows no favoritism. Paul himself writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, with him there is no favoritism. So if the apostle Paul could receive grace, for his life to be totally transformed, so much so he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 1, follow me as I follow the Lord. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't think of anyone who ever said that, follow me as I follow the Lord. Because Jesus said that, he is perfect. In Matthew 4, 19, he says, come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. But apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, I can't think of anyone who said very confidently, confidently in the Lord, follow me as I follow the Lord. Because Paul knew that his transformation was entirely by the grace of God. And anybody can receive grace for their lives to be completely changed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul writes, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. What this old is and what this new is is not clarified by Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. But in the letter to the Ephesians, he clarifies. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, he writes about the old life. Verse 24, he talks about the new life, the transformation. And very interestingly, verse 23 talks about what must happen before the old becomes new. I quote all the three verses from verse 22. You were taught with regard to a former way of life put, to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by disabled desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. To be like God means to be like Jesus. So Jesus is the ultimate example of a personification of God become man. He's Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah 7, 14. So the life of God lived on this earth was the life of Christ. And we're all called to imitate him. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, Be imitators of God. To imitate God is to imitate Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, compared to what he was before, look at the way the Lord completely changed. 
We'll talk about the secret of his life in the next three sessions, today, Thursday, and Sunday. Hopefully, by that time, we'll have a clear understanding of the roadmap before us for us to yield to God completely and see him change us day by day to become more and more like Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul writes, Do not conform any longer the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't conform any longer. All this while you're conforming to the world, pleasing people, going by the world says, not to hurt anybody, not to displease anybody, conforming your principles for the sake of the people of this world, not anymore, but be transformed. The word transform here is metamorphosia, metamorphosia. From the word, we get the English word metamorphosis, which is a word used to describe how a caterpillar in a cocoon becomes a butterfly when it comes out. There's no resemblance. But in a caterpillar and a butterfly, there's no resemblance. Completely changed, transformed, metamorphosis, metamorphosis. And therefore, after we turn to Christ, God wants to change us completely to become more and more like Jesus. And for that, he gives us the resources that we need. What he expects from us is a total surrender to him. In the Old Testament time, the Lord spoke to the people uh, to whom Joel ministered, the prophet Joel. Joel chapter 2 verse 13. Render your heart, not your garments. Garments are the outward life, out outward things that we have. Money, uh, outer, outer things we have, which can always, we can give it away and get it back. But heart is something we hold on to desperately. We want to give the hearts to God. Render your heart, not your garments. And God sees the heart. He's the inner, inner being. What is the inner being? The motivations of our heart. That's what God examines. And look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Look at the way he surrendered totally in a simple question he put to Jesus. The second question he put to Jesus. On the road to Damascus, where he was going to arrest Christians and put them in prison, the Lord met him on the way. He had a vision of Jesus. A bright light he saw. He was blinded. He could not stand it. And he fell down. He lost his sight. But before that, the Lord asked him a question. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? While testifying before the Jews in Jerusalem, in the 22nd chapter of Acts, in verse 8, while giving his testimony, he says, when the Lord appeared to him, he asked him a question. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. The next question Paul put to Jesus was, what should I do, Lord? Acts 22nd chapter, verse 10. What should I do, Lord? Now, at the point of time when he gave his testimony before King Agrippa, many times he says about this testimony before the Jews, 22nd chapter, before Sanhedrin, 23rd chapter, before King Agrippa, 26th chapter, and 9th chapter of Acts, Luke records about his conversion. Paul's conversion. Luke wrote the gospel. Luke wrote the book of Acts. So while testifying before King Agrippa, he says, when the Lord asked him a question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In verse 14, Acts 26, chapter verse 14, God also told him, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. The goats or the prick, as they call it is a pointed instrument, pointed like a, like a diamond-shaped iron piece that's used to goad a bullock, a bullocks, when the bullock car driver rides a bullock, to goad it to go faster. In horse racing, they use a whip. The last 100 meters of a horse race, not 100 meters, 400 meters of a horse race, they use a whip, the jockey use a whip. For a bullock car, they use this prick, the goad, to goad the animal to go fast. It's a very pointed, diamond-shaped iron piece. 
to kick it, you get hurt. The Lord is asking him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. Saul is asking, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus who is persecuting. He couldn't recognize him because he never could imagine who is persecuting. He was persecuting Christians. The Lord asked him, why do you persecute me? When Christians are persecuted, the Lord Jesus Christ is persecuted. Then he tells him, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. When you persecute my people, you're persecuting me. It's bad for you because you're going to get hurt. Then he says, what should I do, Lord? That question, what should I do? Second question, first was, who are you, Lord? Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting? Immediately changed. All that time, till that point of time, he was persecuting Christians. He knew the Bible very well, but did not know the God of the Bible. He was persecuting Christians. He was zealous for the law. He thought these people are all misguided. People are following Jesus. They call them the Nazarene sect or the way. And he was persecuting them. Took his mission very, very seriously. That's a secret. He was faithful to whatever he believed. He had no revelation of God. Only knowledge of the Bible. No knowledge of God. Knowing God is by revelation. And praise God, he had a revelation. He had the revelation of Jesus. What should I do, Lord? That question exposed the heart of Saul totally surrendered to the Lord. What should I do, Lord? Who words? What should I do? Simple. That's what God sees the heart. When God chose David to be the king of Israel, he tells Samuel, who thought the eldest son Eliab is going to be the king, God told him, told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, about Eliab, don't consider his appearance height. Don't consider his appearance height, but I rejected it. God does not look at things man looks at. God looks at the outward appearance. Uh, sorry, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. And God saw in the heart of David a heart after God's own heart. And what is the expression of a man after God's own heart? In Acts 13, 22, it's mentioned, God testifies about David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Everything I want him to do, he will do. That's a man after God's own heart. And here is Saul saying, what should I do, Lord? And God saw his heart. And God knew this man will do what God wants him to do. In fact, while writing to Timothy about his conversion and about God's calling in his life, he makes an amazing statement in his letter. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. He considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even before he was appointed to serve God, the Lord saw the heart of Saul. And he realized his heart is committed to whatever he believed. He, God considered him faithful to whatever he believed. And God knew that when he has the revelation of the Lord, he will be faithful to that revelation, to that gospel. So even before he became a believer, he was faithful to whatever he believed. What he believed was wrong, but he's faithful to it. And God saw that. And the Lord chose him to be instrument to the Gentiles. And in fact, when he told him, what should I do, Lord? The Lord told him, go to Damascus, you'll be told what you have to do. And he goes to Damascus. In Damascus, Ananias, a man of God, 
The Lord appeared to us, Anais and told him, go to the house of Straight Street, there's a man called Saul, and uh, go and pray for him, for him to be healed of blindness and be filled with the Spirit. Immediately, Ananias knew who this man is. He's telling, he's advising Jesus, oh, this man is the Lord of Havoc, Lord. He's coming out to persecute Christians. As if to say, you made a mistake. The Lord tells them, go. Acts 9.15. Go. This man, my chosen instrument, to carry my name before Gentiles and the, and the people of Israel. And immediately, Ananias goes, what a beautiful man of God. What a wonderful man. He changed his opinion. He had a biased opinion about Saul. He had never met Saul. He heard about him. The Lord tells him, go and pray for him. To be filled with spirit and to, heal, and to heal the blindness. And having heard about him, having a bias against this man, may not even met how often it happens among Christians. He's advising Jesus as the Lord does not know Saul. Because you go, praise God. When Ananias goes to Saul, he says, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Immediately, this man who's pursuing Christians became his brother. Because the Lord told him that. And Saul was told on the way to Damascus, go to Damascus, you be told what you have to do. What God did for Saul was to heal him of blindness and through Ananias, fill him with the Holy Spirit. What Saul had to do was to get baptized. And immediately, after being filled with the Spirit, he immediately begins to share the gospel to people. Acts 9.20. At once he began to plead that the Jesus was the Son of God. At once. No wasting time. Because the heart was totally committed. Totally surrendered to the Lord. The certain aspects of Paul's life I'd like to share now. Secret things about his life will encourage us very much. Things that people may not see what God sees. God saw he was faithful to whatever he believed. That's why I believe that many people in the, among the militants in our country and other parts of the world also were misguided. When they have a revelation of Jesus, they'll be so faithful to that revelation. And Saul is a perfect example of that. He's an example for you and me of what God can do in transformation. In 13 verse onwards of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes, even though as a violent man, a persecutor and a blasphemer, I was shown mercy because I acted ignorance. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorance. The grace of Jesus Christ was put upon me abundantly, along with the faith and love that is in Jesus Christ. Almost 15. It's a trustworthy saying that needs full that requires full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But in me, the worst of sinners, he displays unlimited patience, unlimited patience. An example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. His conversion, his transformation, an example for you and me of the unlimited patience of God, the mercy of God. Because God saw his ignorance. God overlooks ignorance. This is what Paul experienced himself. And that's why he told the people in Athens when he went there. They're worshipping idols. He was distressed at idol worship in Athens. He didn't condemn them. He commended them for the religiosity. But he also says in Acts 17.30, in the past, God overlooks such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. First of all, his heart was totally committed to God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9, Paul writes, Romans 1, 9, I serve God with a whole heart. God whom I serve with a whole heart. God sees the heart. He had a whole heart for God. And thereby, he was a person faithful to whatever he believed. He served God with a clear conscience. 2 Timothy 1.3 And number 4, he served in sincerity. 2 Corinthians 2.17 Unlike so many, 
we don't peddle the word of God for profit. Rather, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. A faithful heart, a whole heart, a clear conscience, obviously in the heart, and also a sincere heart. These are all qualities which are known only to God as that person. Others can recognize him outside, but generally it's to the heart. And he surrendered all those things very dear to him, to the Lord. What should I do, Lord? What do you want me to do, I will do. He was called to go to the Gentiles and he kept that vision and he persisted in that vision. Later on to the end of his life, and going to Jerusalem meets elders in Ephesus and he tells them, Acts 20-24, how I consider my life worth nothing to me? If only I finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He possessed the vision, never gave up the vision, never lost his zeal for God because he surrendered his heart to God and also surrendered his mind to the Lord, his mind. Transformation of life is the result of mind being transformed. The mind being transformed. The thinking being transformed. That's why Paul writes to the Ephesians, old life put off, made new attitude of the minds. Our thinking must change. We can't be like Jesus unless we think like Jesus. In the book of Proverbs, 23rd chapter over 7, we read, As a man thinks, so is he. That's a Gideon version I'm quoting. As a man thinks, so is he. If we long to be like Jesus, immediate his life, we should think like Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, to Corinthians, he wrote, in 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. What confidence? A man who was using his mind to devise schemes, where to go next, where to go and arrest Christians, put them in prison, be instrumented in some of them being, being killed, stoned to death. That's how he's devising schemes, where to go next. But then, one day he says, we have the mind of Christ. What's very, very encouraging for you and me is, all of us can choose to have the mind of Christ. To the Philippians he wrote, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. While we give our hearts to God, thereafter, after giving our hearts to God, and all our faculties to God, everything that we have, everything is surrendered to Him. I'll come to it later about the body. He says, the heart, give your heart to Him. Thereafter, after giving our heart to Him, we must ensure the heart does not get polluted by the thoughts we entertain. The mind and the, mind and the heart are very important to get their work together. Yes, we give a heart to God. Say, Lord, remove everything in my heart, not pleasing to you. But thereafter, whatever we keep on thinking gets into the heart. So much so, to the people living in Jerusalem, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14, God says, O Jerusalem, wash the sin from my heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? Whatever the thoughts we harbor, those get into the heart, into the spirit. If we harbor godly thoughts, they will go into the spirit. If we harbor God's word, it will go into the spirit, heart, heart of man. If we have other thoughts, they will go into the heart. That's why in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Guard your heart. It's a wellspring of life. The wellspring of life, from the heart, everything comes out, springs out. So make sure what goes in the heart. What goes in the heart is basically based on what we keep on thinking. So thinking is very, very important for a Christian. 
We neglect thoughts so often. When you want to be a good witness to people, we are very concerned about the way we live because people can see the way we live. We are very concerned about what we speak because people can hear what we speak. We are not concerned about what we think because people don't know our thinking. But God knows our thinking. If you're a people pleaser, you won't worry about the thoughts. If you're a God pleaser, you'll be concerned about the thoughts. Psalm 94 verse 11. For God knows the thoughts of man. He knows they are futile. And the wonderful thing is, God will reveal his thoughts to us. Even the Old Testament time we read. Amos 4.13. Amos 4.13 says, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, who reveals his thoughts to man, who turns down to darkness and treads the high place of the earth. The Lord Almighty is his name. He reveals his thoughts to man. And the Apostle Paul received the thoughts of God. And one day he says, we have the mind of Christ. Thoughts of God, the plans of God, the purpose of God, all there in scriptures. So we should understand, we should never neglect the way we think. Be careful of what you think. Old Testament time, Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the evil man his thoughts. His thoughts. To the Colossians, the Apostle Paul wrote, from the way that we get the insight into how he could have the mind of Christ. He had a clean heart and a clean mind. He went through process before he got changed, but God changed him. In Colossians chapter 3, 1, 2, and 3, he writes, Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. For Christ, he writes, and of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is alive appears, will appear with him in glory. Our hearts and minds must be on things of God. That is the secret of Paul's life, of transformation. He had a problem with the body. I'll talk about that maybe Thursday or Sunday. He had a problem with the body, which he ultimately overcame through Christ. But then his heart and mind were totally committed, surrendered to Jesus. When he had a struggle with sin, he wrote about that to the Romans, the last few verses of Romans chapter 7. In verse 24, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? But then earlier he writes, verse 22, In my inner being, I delight in the law of God. My inner being means the spirit of man, the heart of man. His heart, he delights in the law of God. What about the mind? Romans 7.25 In my mind, I am a slave to God's law. Heart, the inner being, inner man, and the mind, totally on God and the word. Ultimately, he had victory. The starting point for us is, a heart and mind, both must be on things of God. When a mind is on God, heart is not on God, we get a lot of knowledge of the Bible. Knowledge of events happening, knowledge of the Bible. Not knowing God, but knowing the Bible. Knowledge. Just, just knowledge puffs up. First Corinthians 8 chapter was 1. Knowledge puffs up. So mind on the uh, things of God, a lot of knowledge, academic, theoretical knowledge, but no knowledge of God and no change of life. On the other hand, when your heart is on God, mind is not on God, it's no earthly things, we have a conflict. Heart is for God, every time you hear a message, you get thrill, it goes into the heart, you say, Lord, I want to follow you, Lord. Then what happens? Mind is on earthly things, conflict, struggle, heart and mind in conflict. Many Christians have that problem, many Christians. Whereas, 
when the hearts and minds both are surrendered to Jesus, there's transformation, which happened in the case of the Apostle Paul. Now, the mind has all kinds of thoughts coming to it. And I've spoken very often upon this topic. I've spoken in the past. The peak order is there. The kind of thoughts that come and bombard our minds. Sinful thoughts. Jeremiah 4.14. Anxious thoughts. Ephesians, sorry, Philippians 4.6. Don't be anxious, just anxious thoughts come to us. Discouraging thoughts. Psalm 42 verse 5. The psalmist says, my soul is downcast within me. Futile thoughts, wasteful thoughts. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. They come to us. Worldly thoughts. Like Paul told the collision, don't be mind earthly things. Collision 3, 1, 2, 3. And bitter thoughts. Unforgiving thoughts, remembering people's wrongs against you is not from God. First Corinthians 13 5 says, Love keeps no record of wrongs. So, sinful thoughts, anxious thoughts, discouraging thoughts, futile thoughts, worldly thoughts, and bitter thoughts. Put them away, rebook them, because the source of that thought is the devil. He brings those thoughts to us. And the good news for us is we've been given authority over all these thoughts. Every thought that comes to us has been given authority. Paul only wrote about that. From his own personal life is speaking. We have God being, we've been given spiritual weapons. Second Corinthians 10, chapter 3, 4, and 5. Though we live in this world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are the weapons of this world. On the other hand, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself by the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. When these thoughts come to you, remember you're a Christian, you've been given weapons, spiritual weapons, and use a weapon against those thoughts. Put away those thoughts because after all, we have the capacity to think what we want to think. We can choose what we want to think. It's up to us. We are thought over our thoughts. When unwanted thoughts like this come and try to occupy the mind and thereby from the mind get into the spirit. Remember the time when David prayed, Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Writes there, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Heart, thoughts. Anxious thoughts went into the heart. Anxious thoughts went into the heart. See, when you offense and wait me, leave me the way everlasting. So the mind affects the heart. We have to filter what we keep on thinking instead of allowing all these thoughts to occupy our minds. Our mind will be occupied by the word of God. Word of God cleanses. Paul actually, in his heart, delighted in God's word. In a in the mind, slave to God's word. And today we have this amazing promise being fulfilled, already fulfilled, spoken of to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 33, God says, this is a covenant I make with them at that time, I'll put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. And today we have this privilege of that promise being fulfilled through the work of Christ on the cross. And the writer of the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 10, he writes about how that is fulfilled today. Today, you and me have the privilege of God writing the word in our hearts and minds. When the word comes in, into the heart, heart is cleansed. When the word comes into the mind, mind is cleansed. Because God's word cleanses, it sanctifies. John 17, 17, Jesus says, 
to the Father in heaven, when he prayed for the disciples, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. God's word sanctifies. I know many people have struggled with that, with the thoughts. When they pray, they have all kinds of thoughts coming. We read Bible, all kinds of thoughts coming. Rebook those thoughts in Jesus' name. You must be self-controlled. In First Peter 4, 7, we read, be clear-minded and self-controlled that you can pray. Have you noticed how when you read the Bible and you pray, how the mind goes out here and there on the world tour? Take authority over those thoughts and focus on world, focus on things of God. Meditate on God's word. Meditating means focusing. Therefore, let's understand, we have surrender our hearts to God Surrender our minds to God, which means don't entertain any thought that does not please God. These thoughts come to everybody. They come to me. Sinful thoughts, anxious thoughts, discouraging thoughts, futile thoughts, worldly thoughts, bitter thoughts, also guilty thoughts. I left out that guilty thoughts. Even guilt also affects the heart. But by the blood of Christ, there's no guilt for us. These thoughts come. Immediately rebook them. Tell the devil to go in Jesus' name. Because God has given each one of us authority even over Satan. How blessed we are. How privileged we are. In Luke 10, 18, 19, the Lord says to the disciples, 70 of them, I saw Satan fall like lightning in heaven. I have given you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Over all the powers of the enemy, nothing will harm you. And this man, Paul, one time using his mind to devise schemes, arrest Christians, one day says, we have the mind of Christ because he has access to the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, he says, we have the mind of Christ. And how we have the mind of Christ, the process involved, I told you, surrender your heart, surrender your mind, entertain only thoughts that please God, and live by the Spirit. In this passage from verse 9 to 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we understand how Paul could have the mind of Christ. From verse 9 he writes, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, but God is prepared for those who love him. But he will do us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of man? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have the spirit of the world. It is the spirit of God. Then we freely understand what God has given us. Freely understand what God has given us. And therefore, because we have the spirit of God and he knows the thoughts of God, we have access to the thoughts of God. So in our minds, we must keep in mind what God has spoken to us, what God has done for us. From the past, we remember what God did to us, the blessings he gave us. Psalm 103 was true. And what God spoke to us. Revelation chapter 2 was true. What God spoke, what God did to us, remember that. Cut out all the unnecessary thoughts. You'll find the mind is cleansed. Mind is transformed and thereby a life also will get transformed. Now, we think, we have in mind things of God. Remember the time when Peter told this, never lost, this will never happen. When God told them they were going to go to Jerusalem and get arrested, Jesus told them. What did Peter say? Never lost, this shall never happen to you. Look what Jesus says. At the 16th chapter, verse 23. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You are called to have in mind the things of God. The mind gets cleansed. Now, when we are, when the mind is free to think what you want to think, sometimes we're not free to think what you want to think. We are busy about so many things. Today, a lot of work for Logos. We got a board meeting on, my mind is on the, all the what has to be done, apart from message, of course. And mind is on the figures, financial figures, the reports, all those things. But then the mind is free. 
feel to think what you want to think what do you think about for example night time when you sleep about to sleep what do you think about at night when your mind is free whole day's work is over you are free to think what you want to think what do you think about i give you examples one not to follow other to follow what not to follow is found in micah chapter 2 verse 1 where the lord says woe to those who plan iniquity who plot evil on their beds at morning's light they cry out because of power to do it it's the power to do it they plot evil in the bed night time thinking about what to do next what bad thing to do next on the other hand look at david some 63 was 6 on my bed i remember you i think of you to the watches of the night remember god his word have in mind things of god as much as possible and as you go along in life you will find slowly a thinking changes hearts change life changes so tonight before I, i'm going to pray for all of us please surrender your heart and mind to the lord i'll talk about other aspects later on as we go on on thursday and sunday